the people of sake actually brought me into sake. Back in 1988, this place was actually in Ginza on the main drag. At first it was kind of soy sauce, it was miso. To the point where it actually changed my life. New Year's Day 1989. Uh, not just sake as a beverage, but all the culture and history of Hi, thanks for listening to Sake on Air. This is Frank. I'm filling in for Justin this week because he is on a long-deserved vacation. For the show this week, we have a great interview recorded with Wolfgang Agnell, the CEO of Riedel Japan. In fact, when we did this recording, he also ran a tasting for us using the Riedel glassware. We'll be releasing a bonus recording of that tasting session next week. I hope you enjoy the show today. Thank you. Well, thank you for inviting us to, to, to Sake on Air. Um, I'm Wolfgang Agiel. I um, uh, come originally from Austria, from the mountains of Tyrol. And um, it's the first time I came to Japan in 1985. Uh, it was uh, at the occasion of, of an event that, that was just happened to be in Japan, which was called the, the World Skills uh, ev- uh, Organization is, event, is organizing a kind of a world, world championship for, for vocational skills for, for young people under 21. So I participated uh, as, as Austria's representative for hotel and restaurant service. Well, originally from the hotel industry, service was my, was, my, was my choice. They had, I think, over 30 other uh, categories of, of, from mechatronics to graphic design to beauty therapy, uh, uh, cooking. Um, and and um, I, luckily, I did quite well at the competition. Um, and I think it's due to Japan. I think I won. Uh, had it not been in Japan, I think I would have been second or third. I think the Swiss or the German would have beaten me. And um, because I think it was, thinking back, it was uh, judo at four years old that that helped me. And turning back, I was able to, I had an intuitive understanding of, of Japan in some way from that early experience. Um, and uh, and uh, I trusted my Japanese assistants. So every every competitor got two assistants to help them with 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 getting materials from from the backyard, and I communicated quite rather well with them. And the German and the, the Swiss they they did it themselves because they didn't trust their their assistants. And I think that's how I I won, and uh, felt an affinity with Japan. Uh, tried to find a way back, and it took me three years to find a way, and ended up in in Osaka at the Tsuji Academy, the Tsuji Culinary Institute, and I was uh, educating, teaching about uh, hotel and restaurant service uh, for a year. Uh, but I wanted to always to be in, 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 in business, and during that time I contacted Riedel uh, because I, I was very familiar with the product. That was, it was a product I really could identify with. And uh, first I think he actually threw me out of the office because he thought as a young, a 21 year old uh, what's he gonna do for us in Japan but after a while uh, I started to to started basically in Tokyo to work for Riedel in 89 and uh, mm-hmm. since then been in Japan until uh, 95 uh, for seven years I went to Sydney for Riedel uh, also still taking care of Japan for five years, covering Riedel's business in Asia Pacific, uh, Latin America and Africa. And then in the year 2000, I came back to Japan to start the Riedel subsidiary. And that's been back since. So, How important is uh, Riedel for, I mean, Japan for Riedel? Uh, the Japanese market as a country, it's, I think, the second biggest market after the U.S. as a country. So, so we have different ways to look at the world. Uh, in Japan, also we have a, a substantial retail business, our own direct retail business. We have 15 of our own stores, three freestanding stores, an outlet store, and 11 shop-in shops and department stores. And of course, online business and and and, and hotel restaurant business, which is also quite quite important for us. Uh, we also take care of, of two of our sister brands called Nachbarn and Spiegeler. Would you mind going over the Rita philosophy that's, that inspires sort of your work and, and your guidelines for the, uh, for the products that you create? Just really briefly what, what that yes. is. For us, um, the content is really what determines the shape of a glass. I mean, we look at, uh, at glassware or, or drink the enjoyment of, of beverages 
in a completely epicurean way. It is, it's a sensory, it's all about sensory pleasure. So we do not make glasses to taste or professional tasting glasses. I mean, although some of the glasses work quite well as tasting glasses, but the, the, the main purpose of our, of our philosophy is to, our mission is to, to create ideal shapes that will, that will uh, maximize a beverage's harmony and highlight its unique characteristics. And as such, we, we first and foremost, we look at the, the beverage itself, the basic composition of the beverage itself, the flavor composition, before we, we, we look into other, into other elements, um, um, like, like aesthetics, for example. For us, always aesthetics uh, come last. Form follows function in our case, so we really follow the Bauhaus principle in this, in this sense. I think one of the key points also for when we look at designing glasses is, is that all shapes or all glasses are uh, fit to, to human physiology and human anatomy and uh, especially also the ergonomics because most uh, anatomy and physiology across different cultures is fairly consistent. What is different is the composition of the beverage and um, the last the least important in, for our, in our case is the aesthetics. So, so the design itself is maybe beautiful, but really s shape and size, especially size, is very, very important when it, when it comes to, 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 to the uh, capturing of the aromas as well as the, 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 uh, uh, the flow of the liquid to, to your palate. What you mean by uh, human anatomy is the size and the shape of the mouth is the angle of the head. Yes, it's, correct. It's how the body takes. The it, it is how it is your ergonomics with with a, with a physical object. Uh, you will you will uh, reach out with your hands to a glass. You have four fingers. They're mostly similar sizes, so four fingers will for example, fit into, onto the stem of this glass very comfortably. I don't have to squeeze myself into to reach to reach it. I I will my my eyesight will determine how much already calculate how much liquid is in it is in the glass, and it will already send you a message as to how fast you will drink or what how cautiously you will approach the drinking mechanism. Um, also, the 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 when we talk about the aromas, the, the aromas inside of a glass, and we will see later that it's really important to have egg-shaped, convex-shaped glasses to even be able to capture, physically capture aromas. You must have this kind of uh, convex shape. Uh, you will also have the, it determines the, the, size, of the, the, the size of the rim, uh, the shape of the rim, uh, the, the amount of liquid in the glass, the overall shape and proportions determine the intensity as well as the quality of aromas. And when we talk about the drinking flow, you will, the, the, the head, every time you drink from a vessel, is it a glass, a bottle, a straw, you will, your, your, the position of your head will be different, the angle will be different, the position of your tongue will be different, the shape of your tongue will be different. It will offer a different surface area to the liquid every time you drink from a different vessel. The, the, and the speed, depending on the slant of your head, the speed of the, the velocity of the liquid when it enters your mouth will be different because liquids flow by gravity. And if we, if we lean backwards, the liquid will flow down. And if we don't lean backwards, the liquid cannot flow down. It will, it will, it will stop in the middle of your, of your mouth. So just to give you a bit of a background of the history of our involvement with sake, uh, in general is that we, when we came in the mid-90s to Japan and to sort of widely, broad, broadly introduced the real concept ac across, the, across the country, um, uh, one of the first questions, since Japanese discovered basically for the first time that the, sh the, the glass shape can make a big impact on the, on the aroma and taste of, of wine, uh, one of the first questions that we received was, well, what about sake? Um, and uh, we did not have an answer we had because we didn't know sake and uh, we were very uh, reluctant, uh, very reluctant to even touch the subject because of sake being so entrenched in tradition and in culture. So we did not, for us this was quite a hot potato 
uh, not knowing anything about it and uh, it was completely unfamiliar to us. So it was not until 79, 97, sorry, uh, that we received a, a quite a unusual request from a maker in, in uh, Kanazawa, from, from Fukumitsia. Uh, they told us basically that uh, we have bought all your shapes, all your 26 different varietal sh specific shapes, and uh, we have tasted all our sakas in it, and uh, we believe that there is a few shapes in there that, I mean, that blew us, blew us away, uh, that they delivered aromas that we never have smelled before. And uh, we really would like you to start to make a, a, a sake glass. And um, we cautiously met them, we met, reluctantly met them actually in Hong Kong for the first time uh, at Wien Expo because they were exhibiting there and um, came back to Japan, did some orientation workshops in Kanazawa and uh, also got the owner George Riedel involved. Uh, also to get at that time John Gauntner, the three of them basically then determined that uh, Daiginjo, the, the, the Daiginjo category should be the target and not just a sake glass, it should be more specific because Daiginjo is the aromatic uh, uh, variety, the more aromatic variety, much closer to wine than any other sake, uh, which commands, we knew it had to, it, it commanded an egg shape, it commanded a convex shape because in order to capture aromas, you will need to have a convex shape. We continued in Bordeaux with 20 brewers um, uh, from a organization called Hakokai at the time. I mean, these were the young, the young brewers at that time. They are the old ones now, 20 years later. Um, and we started off with 100 different shapes that went, we, we brought down to 60 and 30 and uh, uh, down to 12 shapes. And this is when the actual official workshop started. So prior to that, it was only a, a preliminary workshop for us to get orientation of which direction uh, we, are, we are going to, what are they looking for, what are the makers looking for. And it's not us putting any votes into this, it is right, really us facilitating the process. The, the, the results, the elimination uh, was exclusively done by the brewers and the participants. We did further workshops across Japan because we really needed to have to narrow it down further down to six shapes. Uh, because it only makes sense to do final workshops with a smaller number, otherwise it's getting too, too, too broad. Uh, we sent those six prototypes to members of the Daiginjo Association, and overall there was 45 different brewers involved uh, in the individual evaluation. We received their results, we recorded them, uh, because we wanted to match those against the final official workshop at the uh, Austrian Embassy in 1999 already, so that is also 20 years ago now, uh, which was hosted by the ambassador and George Riedel, and 12 sake breweries uh, that then chose the one shape that you also have now in front of you. Uh, it is a sake glass. It is a glass specifically made for sake. It is varietal specific, uh, but it looks pretty much like a generic white wine glass, so nothing really spectacular overseas. Uh, but in Japan, this was quite a revolution because uh, we did also have some um, uh, resistance across uh, along the way. I remember one workshop in Mito, uh, north, north of Tokyo, uh, where there was a quite an older generation demographic participating and they helped us out. They, they lent us their palettes, so to speak, uh, but they weren't really sure what we were actually doing. Um, they pretty much eliminated, rated exactly the same way as all the other brewers. Uh, they eliminated all the small vessels because we, we put very small vessels that are like Ochoco-like sizes on stems uh, because we have those from our ODV collection and they were immediately eliminated. But when they realized what we were doing, uh, they immediately shifted their votes back to the small vessels because they were afraid that it would interfere with, with, the culture, with, with, with the cultural way of drinking sake. So we put the question to our, our group of other friends, the, the younger, more progressive brewers at the time, and uh, they really pushed us. They said, no, you must do this. Uh, you have to do this because without, without vessels that non-Japanese are familiar with, uh, that they, they can easily integrate into their lifestyle, there will be no growth outside of Japan. 
it will you know, as long as it if it stays within the culture it's very hard it, there will be limitations on on the proliferation of sake in general if it comes together with japanese cuisine or only with japanese culture we also made a, a version without the stem which became very very popular and then 10 years later so we are we're talking in decades um, we, we made an event uh, with different uh, brewers and they really did, they requested a Jumai glass. Jumai glasses were requested throughout, since ever we, we started making uh, sake glasses, uh, but, but it was then that they really uh, said again, you, we need a glass for Jumai. At the same time, we also had a dilemma because overseas, people called the, the Daiginjo glass the Riedel sake glass. And that was always a dilemma for us because it never was a sake glass. It always was a glass specifically for Daiginjo. So we, we knew we, we were interested to, to, to set the rockets, record straight in this respect, um, but we didn't know where to start. Um, we started with John Gartner. Also, we, we always started with John, actually, I have to say. Uh, it's, it was always very, very helpful to have him, have him on board. We started off with, I think, 60 different shapes initially. Uh, the selection of sake was interesting because they, they, they chose, uh, they recommended the sake, the industry recommended the sake that we, we didn't um, judge the selection of the sake, but it was a very Ginjo-like Jungmai. And um, immediately I remember that uh, Philip Harper, who was also a participant in these initial workshops, said, well, this is not Jungmai. So we, our, our feelers were a little bit of, on alert. And this was already uh, an indication of what may or may come, which was a, a split in the industry of what Chumai actually is. And uh, we added a more traditional Chumai style to the mix. We did uh, hearings and workshops with, with, with brewers. Uh, but uh, we have to say that the results were split. Uh, there was a group that said, this is the glass that we want to promote, or this is the Jumai that we believe is Jumai. The other group favored a style that was more egg-shaped. They wanted to reduce the aroma. I can't actually remember exactly what the, what the, what the, uh, uh, the individual comments were, but we just know from the numbers that we received when we got there, when we wrote down the numbers, uh, we, we came to this result. And uh, the result was that we had to stop. We had to pull the plug from the project because it's not our place to, to determine what is Jumai. And uh, we just felt it was too early, so we stopped the project. And it was only f four years later, in 2017, that we restarted. Um, there was, the industry has changed. Also, from all, we got increasing inquiries from overseas. Chefs started to in integrate um, umami-laden ingre uh, ingredients into their food. They wanted to pair it with Jumai rather than Ginjo style. And uh, we knew the time uh, was right, it was, was, was more ripe. So we restarted the project in 2017. This was the basic premix. And we also included uh, Jumais on the very end of the, of the, of the Jumai spectrum. Much more richer, much more um umami-rich styles. Uh, that we ha did not have included in, in 2010. Uh, this was the basic flavor profiles that we were aiming for. So we, had, we, were, we were targeting this, this flavor profile, very full body, umami rich character, and, and uh, uh, versus the Daiginjo glass, which is a lot cleaner and light, lighter body. We started with first prototypes. That was the first round of prototypes. We started in Daishichi in uh, uh, Yamagata Prefecture, uh, Fukushima Prefecture. Sorry, um, big, was Daishichi. Why? Because Mr. Da Mr. Ota from Daishichi already told us in 20 years earlier that his Kimoto tastes really, really great out of the Riedel Monrache glasses, which are very wide and open shapes. So we, we had this already, already in the back of the mind, so he was, he was the perfect place to start. Uh, we continued with other uh, uh, brewers. Here is uh, Tomita Shuzo. Uh, and after the first initial uh, orientation sessions, 
uh, we knew which classes to eliminate. And uh, the ones that were first eliminated was the Aginjo uh, shapes, the sort of egg shapes, smaller shapes, and, and some, other, some other shapes. So we knew the direction. Uh, we went, I went to Austria to talk to George Riedel because uh, his input is always extremely valuable and, and vital for these kind of projects because he, he has always these gold nuggets of, of ideas that really push the envelope. And he did uh, because he said he rejected those flower pots for ergonomic reasons. I said, this is, this is not a design language that I would like to, to promote, that, that I would like to, to, to release. Uh, this uh, cannot be comfortably held, held by, by a lady in, in one hand. These glasses must have a stem. Originally, we thought it was a great idea to have stemless glasses because uh, that would really pair well with our Daiginjo glass, which is stemless and we could make a very nice set. Uh, we thought it's, it's quite neat, uh, but uh, he said this must have a stem and it must be, you must comfortably hold it in your hand and it must, be, it must elevate the sake experience to the level of wine on any table around the world. And this was his key message for this, for this, for this, uh, for this session. He also introduced uh, in, in addition to round shapes, uh, I will maybe talk about later about the, 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 the velocity of, of, of the liquid when it enters our mouth. Um, round shapes are much faster, higher velocity, much faster flow than diamond shapes. And so George Riedel uh, included some diamond shapes into the mix and um, we made new prototypes and put those final shapes into the race for, as a final, as a final, uh, uh, as a preliminary. This was the semi-finals, actually. Different diamond shapes, different egg shapes. And we went back, we talked to uh, professionals uh, individually, not talk, but actually tasted them. Um, I think it was 42 different separate workshops that we did. In, in Japan in, within two years. Um, the biggest tasting, the most intense tasting I remember was with Philip Harper. He tasted all of his sakes in all of the glasses, which nobody has done. And we were there for four hours and, and the result was, was, was very, very interesting. Um, back to Tokyo, we, we, we worked to, with the International Sake Challenge judges, uh, also separately. Every time we do a workshop, the the evaluation is private, is individual, that we, we do not like, uh, we, we uh, ask for not to speak to each other, not to influence each other, not to, to disregard personal aesthetical preferences, um, maybe operational prefer preferences. Somebody may say, why well, I don't like this kind of shape in my brewery, I don't want to taste from this. And we, because at this stage, it's all about aroma and taste and texture. Um, this was the result of the second stage of the workshops. And we had a clear direction and we knew exactly which shape had to go into the final. So it's 100% transparent and uh, to really uh, safeguard the integrity of the whole process and to make it, make it as transparent as possible. These are the finalists. Two, egg, two round shapes, three diamond shapes. And uh, we made sure that we did two separate work, final workshops, one in Nagoya uh, with uh, 12 brewers. And they chose glass number five as the winner. And uh, two days later, we did the same with different brewers, different sakes in Tokyo. And we also number five was cl the clear winner. And they did not know about their results. They did not talk to each other. And it's impossible anyway to manipulate the result because the voting and the elimination is done open. So everybody has to raise their hand at the same time and vote and eliminate. And everything is transparent. Everybody can see what happens. We also made sure that we, we also got some re consumer requests um, people were complaining, well, how do I handle this thing? 
Um, it, it doesn't look like it's not a wine glass, it's not a cocktail glass. And if I swirl it too heavily, it might even spill. So we, we gave it very clear instructions. We, we say that you, the maximum server level, service level from both glasses is about 80 uh, uh, milliliters. Um, the recommended drinking temperature for our purposes for drinking it at up to room temperature is uh, uh, 15 to 20 degrees. This is also the temperatures the glasses were workshopped uh, at. And uh, for Daginjo, it's, it's much lower, of course, between 10 and 15 degrees um, for the two types of, of uh, sake. Uh, we know that there is other shapes on this map, on this flavor map, uh, between Juma and, and Daginjo. And those two uh, labels, I call them labels. Uh, for us, Daginjo is a label that represents the most characteristic character of the style of sake. Same with Jumai. There is, of course, you know, there's many different uh, uh, variations and there's probably many different shapes in here, but these would be our two anchor shapes that we have right now um, after 20 years of, of involvement with, with, with sake. That is a first initial tour through the history of uh, the development. Mm. So if you have any question. I do have a bit of context to, to give you guys is that Wolfgang and I would go out to an izakaya. We went out yes. to an izakaya mm. because Wolfgang just really couldn't let go of the project I'm thinking now because you decided on your shape. You had your shape. It was in production and you were still so involved in the project. And I think now, talking to you now and thinking back to that dinner that we were having, how difficult was it to let go? Um, well, it's intense because you have to dig very deep and, and sake is, is unlimited in its depth and in, in, in it's so complex and, and and you get lost so easily, uh, and I think I think it's 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 just to have reached the bottom of the sea, and reached a certain ground, and I can stand on it, and 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 it's 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 now it's very easy actually to 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 look at sake, and I would say I have I have found an understanding, a, a, a depth of understanding that that allows me to to navigate sake now really freely without without any crutches or without without help to have mm -hmm. a compass I have orientation I know where to go and and I can really swim and freely. what's really wonderful is it's it's your own compass in terms of this has happened while this has been a, a obviously a business project mm -hmm. a, um, a very serious business mm -hmm. project within that you've also had a personal journey i think yeah absolutely absolutely no. and and so you've your your the direction that you move within the sake world is informed by of course the business element but more importantly what you've experienced along the way yes 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 no no it's 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 been a journey but at the same time it's 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 very important it's the dna of the brand mm. is is the integrity of its process how to how to how to arrive at certain shapes and this is really what the real philosophy is all about and i'm the custodian of that philosophy here in and japan and you're really strict so my, too because the, the I weight did the has tasting. been very heavy yeah. <laughs> i did the tasting and 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 it was no more friends rebecca it was don't think about aesthetics stop thinking about what you like stop thinking mm -hmm just taste and you were really really strict from beginning to end and it was great because you kept us in line you mm. kept us disciplined mm. and you made it purely about process mm. um which was a revelation when we came to with that within our small little tasting that we did what the shape we came to in yes. the end yes and it seems to me very quickly very quickly no one to focus too much on it but you have this hasn't all been like an an easy ride as far as getting this selling this to the end consumer yes. right or, or where the end yes. consumer is but you've had i think quite a lot of negative feedback as well haven't you and oh yes yes. i know yes. you're very good at dealing with it and no then, i mean we did we did have we did have some uh very initial surprising reactions from some corners of the industry the, f the interesting was you had the the brewers works excited 
uh, consumers were highly curious and very embraced it really easily. Uh, but then we, our mistake was that we did not provide the manual for the glass that we made and did not have all the support information of how we did we end up with the shape. There were some sake uh, experts outside of Japan that did not know Riedel. And if they don't know Riedel, they don't know what, what to expect. And, and they didn't know about the, the workshop process that we did mm -hmm. and the development and who was behind it and so forth. So for them is like, and, and they were kind of, they grew up in, 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 in the cultural and the traditional way to enjoy sake, which is fantastic, but, but they were in that world. They just saw a wine glass, basically. Yes, they right. saw a glass and who are these people from Riedel that bring this and who are they to, 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 to tell us what we should drink from? Mm -hmm. So, so. But of course, once they understand that it's yes, not just a wine yes, glass and they yes. hear, you know, this, this story. Yes. of how you actually put it together, then of course those objections yes. could not I mean, exist. I uh, mean, if, if we were coming now into the sake world, some of those uh, uh, arguments may have been justified because, mm. you know, okay, now we see an opportunity with sake, we, we enter this, mm. we enter the world of sake as, you know, the, the, the wine glass company, but, mm. but we were working on this already 20 years ago. Mm. Um, but I mean, if I can, you know, turn this and spin this into a positive, I do know someone that was a sake expert from outside of Japan that did have a, a very strong opinion and you graciously guided that person to a point of understanding and not only just a point of understanding, a point of realization, which is, you know, it's, it's really, I think it's proof that this isn't, isn't just a shape. That what is behind it? Yes, of course, there is a science. There is a there's a technique behind selecting the shape, but along the way, in the selection process and the delivery of yes. the product to the market, you're very, very much about inclusivity and listening, mm. yes. hearing people, and supporting mm. them. I mean, um, I may have said had the same rejection or the same reaction as he had uh, to yeah, seeing I'm the honest, I think maybe I would have as well. Actually, um, couldn't blame him. So all mm. I needed. To tell him is show him. He or she. We're not. We're not specifying. No, no, he or she. <laughs> no, he now, no, he now actually has become a very, very good friend yeah, and and a, and, a, and, a, and a brother in arms of, yeah. of about the whole the whole thing and and it's probably I would say one of the most uh, uh, incredible mm. engagement uh, uh, interactions I ever had with mm. anybody in in this kind of way and it was it was it was it was a revelation also for me to 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 have that yeah. and to. To, to to be able to I think that person through the course of the conversation would have been phenomenally surprised with your depth of, depth of knowledge oh, I yeah. think that that would have also been oh, an yeah. important mm -hmm. um, yeah. outcome they've, they've openly said that as well mm -hmm. perhaps we can get them on the show and get their actual side of the story yes. it's oh, oh, great. more fair isn't it yes. Yes. what's fascinating is how when you approach the glass from your mouth and nose Actually, your brain has already a very strong, a very strong idea about what 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 to expect and and how how it, what it will do. Yes, we do. We do. We do. All our senses are involved, and this is perhaps all our senses are involved. And this is really, I think, maybe the one, the 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 most important journey for any beverage, including sake. If you look at the journeys that sake makes or wine makes from the rice field to the brewery, from the brewery into the bottle, from the bottle into the vessel. But the one we always forget about is the delivery, the journey from the vessel to our five senses. When we touch the vessel, when we smell the aromas, when we taste the, we taste and, the, and feel the texture of the, of the liquid. And even with glasses and maybe with other vessels, it's a little more difficult. You have even the sense of hearing involved in your sensory experience of, 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 of enjoying a, a, a drink. Maybe I'm a very tactile person. Maybe that's the reason. But I'm always curious and interested in the weight of my glass. I love playing with weight not just shapes or so forth but for example you have beautiful lacquerware and it's lovely and light but it looks heavy and so i love that 
sort of trickery that tricks my mind to think it's going to be heavy, but it's actually quite light. Or, mm. you know, that really, really fine usuhari glass. Mm. I love how I, when I hold it, I think, this is going to be so gentle and crisp and lovely. Or something that's rich and earthen and heavy. I'm, I'm thinking, oh, this sake is going to be delicious. Like my mind's telling me based on weight. And I wonder, is weight something that you also consider? Yes, absolutely. We have, I mean, it depends on the, the weight is very, very important. And, and, and uh, you may be very uh, more sensitive or more attuned to, to, to the tactile uh, experience of, of holding a vessel. But everybody is to some extent. And, uh, but this is only a question of the glass execution. You blow it thinner or you blow it thicker. If you, if you are in banquet, you, it's very difficult to have a thick glass. If you have a very small, fine restaurant, you can have it as thin as paper. Uh, and uh, that is a, an aesthetic or a, a different, different, appeals to a different sensation. Uh, we also have very, very super thin glasses, which we call super leggero, which is called super light. Uh, in, in the wine glass, we also have this for Daiginjo and, and Jumai. So we do uh, offer this as well. But it is, it is, it is uh, um, for us, it is always uh, the tactile uh, is only one sense that, that is engaged when we, when, we, when, we, when we appreciate the thing. And what, what we're real is really at the forefront of things is aroma, taste and texture in the mouth. So as a follow-up question, then in your Epicurean approach, something like the tactile nature, the weightiness or the, the, the texture of the vessel is more in terms that's more aesthetics or sensory rather than the, the delivery of the beverage. And it, it's not something that would maybe maximize, as you said, the harmony and the unique characters of the beverage. Yes, correct. I mean, it, it, it is your, the sense of touch of your hands in, is involved. It's not your sense of touch in your mouth. That is involved when you when you when you hold when you hold the beverage. So, so the sense of touch, I agree. There is there is probably a a, a, a shape that is um, uh, so thin that you're just feeling you're holding the liquid. Mm -hmm. And when it's when you put it to your mouth to your lips, uh, you, you you feel like it's 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 it's, it's perfectly uh, it's a perfect sensation on your lips. But it does not. It is the shape that determines the flow not the thickness. Mm -hmm. Of course, if you have a, a rolled rim, a very thick rim, it will also affect the flow. Mm -hmm. But, but um, it is when you put it to the lips, it's really, we, we are thinking about the liquid. We are thinking about the sake or the wine mm -hmm. in the glass and to, to, to maximize the harmony of that and to, 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 to really uh, get, get the best out of, of each beverage. I mean, uh we have beautiful sets. Uh, are you doing this regularly or printed for us specially? No, um, um, unfortunately, we do use this uh, set also for for our customers. So okay. we, we offer this set in our in our stores where we have a tasting bar where we mm -hmm. where we do these tastings, these glass tastings, as we call them, uh, sensory workshops, that, as we call them, um, for consumers, for for anybody that that uh, that would like to book a tasting. I'm curious, what is the demographic and profile of most of the people who come to your workshops? Is it predominantly 30-somethings? Is it a little bit more widespread? Is it Japanese or inbound? Or oh, definitely residents? Japanese. Right. Japanese, I would say, um, I mean, many of our customers have know the Daginjo glass. The Daginjo glass has been around for 20 years. Um, we, 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 it's consistently selling in Japan. It's, it's quite popular as a, as a gift also. And uh, the curiosity, I mean, people are extremely curious. And uh, it's not just brewers, it's not just in the industry professionals, but especially consumers, because they know the real story. If you don't know the real, uh, the real philosophy of, of, of uh, uh, content determines shape and how it, how it affects your perception of, of beverages, um, it it may surprise you to have these kind of glasses in front of you, or especially this this Jumai glass. But if you know the 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 riddle from the wine glass side, 
then you, people are extremely curious about it. And it's from all demographics that, that I could not say that there is, it's more older or younger. They all, of, all of them actually are, are uh, interested. Maybe they're more interested in the Juma glass because it's a little bit less expensive than the Daginja glass. <laughs> What should we do about the tasting? I mean, okay. we have one. I've already started, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> and that wraps it up for this week. Thanks for listening. Sake on Air is broadcast from the Japan Sake and Shochu Information Center and made possible with the generous support of the Japan Sake and Shochu Makers Association. It is a joint production between Potske Productions and Export Japan. You can find us on social media at, at Sake on Air. Or you can reach out by email by messaging us at questions at sakeonair.com. Thank you so much for listening. We'll be releasing a special recording of the tasting next week. Until then, kanpai! <laughs>